Hello, everyone. We are live. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> so very happy to welcome today the one, the only, the CSS evangelist. That is Kevin Powell. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, very excited to have you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Awesome that you came. And we're welcoming you for a couple of reasons. One, we've got a few questions for you. And obviously, um, happy to take questions in the chat that you might have for Kevin, so leave them down there. And two, we have our 404 page design competition, which we launched last week. And we have had some really brilliant designs, which I can't wait to show you. One in particular, I think you'll be very keen on. So shall we get started with the questions? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing those 404 pages. But yeah, let's dive into the questions. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you was, what are the most common CSS errors you see beginners making? And what should people avoid? Yeah, so I think I think the most common ones I see are people really doing things in isolation. Um, so when they're looking at a design or they're trying to code something up, they're looking at like, okay, I'm starting at this part because that's the top of my page. And I write the HTML and then I write the CSS for that. And then I get to the next part. I'm going to write the HTML for that. And then I'm going to do the CSS for that. And they just do one piece at a time and they work their way through page one. And then they go to page two and they do the exact same thing there. Um, and it just means they're writing so much code that they don't have to be writing because they end up repeating themselves. Um, you're not, you know, they're not looking at the big picture first and narrowing down. And it makes a lot of sense, especially when you think of like, okay, I'm doing, I have to write some HTML. And then when you're first looking at it on the page, you have nothing to look at. So you want it to look, you, you want to style it up right away. Um, but I think it's really important to do all of the HTML first and then go to the CSS. And before even writing the HTML to look at the big picture and to sort of look at what you're going to be doing, see what type of repetitive elements you can find and really start writing your code from the big picture and slowly narrowing down from there. Mm, that's a really good tip. I'm doing your responsive design course at the moment, actually. <laughs> I'm doing um, the part with the simplicity blog, which you can find over on Scrimba. Yes, plan plug there. Um, but yeah, I've noticed, similar to what you're describing, that um, certain elements don't look the same, but actually you are reusing a lot of things. So yeah, that's a fantastic tip. Okay, my next question is, CSS gets a lot of flack. I mean, apart from you now, I don't think I've ever met anyone who actually likes it. Um, so why do you think people dislike it? And what can they do to make it more enjoyable for themselves, do you think? Yeah, um, I think that, I mean, that, that's sort of why I call myself a CSS evangelist is to try and change people's minds about it. Because as you said, it, there's a lot of people who seem not to, to enjoy it. And I think it, I like, I mean, it's what I like the most. So hmm. um, I think that, there's two different, it depends where people are coming from a little bit, uh, but it boils. So like you get people that are just starting to get into development and HTML and CSS are the first things they're learning. And then you also get people that are coming more from a JavaScript or computer science background. Um, so the way they're coming into it can be really different. So sometimes why they get frustrated with CSS is a little bit different, but I think for both, it boils down to CSS appearing to be very simple. So mm -hmm. it's, selector property value property like just property value pairs so when you look at it and you start writing it and you start learning it it comes across as super easy its background is blue mm -hmm. color is red you know margin is 20 pixels whatever it is it's really simple on that level and when you're looking at it you're seeing someone else's code it's relatively easy to understand what's happening mm -hmm. so people start taking it for granted going oh it's really easy it's just going to work i just make property value pairs and everything is there and then you start trying to, you get past the background is blue and the color is white and you start getting into layouts and getting into more complex areas and then getting into sort of the, some of the nuances with it. And there are some things that are a little bit strange when you get into like collapsing margins and some, some behaviors that aren't uh, intuitive necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so because they take it for granted, they don't learn it maybe as deeply as they should to understand what's actually going on. And then they yeah. get frustrated when it doesn't work the way they expect it to work. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that's where most of the hate comes from is it should be working this way. This makes sense what I wrote and it's not instead of, you know, take a breath, take a step back and find out that there's a logic behind CSS. There is a reason it works the way it does. And it's trying to sort of 
build up the fundamentals and really understand it from a, a very basic core level. And I think it makes everything else a lot easier after that. And it starts, once you understand how it's meant to work and how the page sort of renders the DOM and all of that, um, it starts becoming a lot easier. Uh, yeah, I think it starts becoming a lot easier to tackle. Yeah, what you're describing sounds awfully familiar um, <laughs> <laughs> to my own experience. And it's almost like styling 90% of the page takes, I don't know, an hour. And then the last tweaks take, well, you know, 10 days or so. Yeah. So, yeah. But I also agree that the base level of knowledge is what you need to overcome that. So, yeah, that's a fantastic tip. Daniel is asking, um, do you think we'll be moving into an era where browser support for features is unanimous? Well, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> we can dream. What do you think? Is that ever going to happen? Um, I, I think we'll be, I think we're already at a place now where it's a million times. People complain about browser support, but the, I, I think people who complained a lot about it weren't around five plus years ago when mm -hmm. like if you were around with Internet Explorer 6, um, it was a different story and that was one of the bigger browsers. Um, so I think we're already at a much better place than we've ever been at before in that. In yeah. the, um, but I also think that yes, in the sense that like the browsers are, you know, it used to be on much slower update cycles too, which was a big problem. Now all the browsers are on pretty mm -hmm. frequent update cycles, which helps. Um, and they seem, you know, we're there are some like I'm, I'm Firefox has said subgrid forever now and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for someone else to even have it behind a flag and it's not happening. So I'm frustrated with some things, uh, but I think overall it's getting a lot better. And I think going forward, like because we're always adding new features, there's always going to be some browsers that are behind implementing the newest features than someone else. And, you know, I'm looking at where CSS is going and there's all these really exciting things coming. And then it's, you know, as I said, subgrid, I'm one of the things I'm most excited about that Firefox has had for a while and no one else has even looked at. So I think that's always going to happen where one is going to get it much before everyone else, but eventually all the other ones will get there. So you will have to be playing with it. And if you want to use cutting edge new stuff, it's the same with uh, JavaScript or anything else. When you're using the cutting edge new things that just come out, you got to wait for some other people to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, I think we're at a better place now than, than we have been ever and it'll only get better. Yeah, that's true. We we could go back to 2014 if we want that. Yeah. Um, Kasim says, how do you choose your colors to make them look good? <laughs> I think the easiest thing to do is keep it really simple. Um, mm. when, when I was teaching in the classroom, and we, one of the things you'd see the most often is just like, it's, it's, it's really hard to get a lot of colors to work well together. And then you really have to start learning a lot about color theory and understanding that. Um, you're getting into the saturation, making sure that you have the, like a balance between them. If you just choose like a main, you, have, you choose like one color. So you get, I don't know, you have a blue that you really like, and that's going to be your, your primary color, your main color. And then from there you go with white and black and shades of gray, like white and black, mm -hmm. they're not colors, but they're colors and they're thing they're, they are things that you're using on your page. So you have your one primary color. You can do lighter and darker versions of that. You have your white, your black and shades of gray you can have a really nice site with just that instead of overcomplicating mm. it and trying to bring in lots of different colors. Mm. Um, the other thing is if you do have a main imagery or things like that, like getting colors from images can really be a nice way to go as well. Uh, if you're not comfortable with colors, because if you see a really nice photograph, and, you know, a picture of something that really speaks to you, it, it looks good because part of it is the colors and the combination of colors in it is working. So you could steal colors and steal ideas from that as well. Um, look at what other websites mm. are doing. You know, never be shy. When it comes to design, people are really shy about looking at what other people have done. But if you don't have experience on the design side, I think that's the only way you can learn is by looking at what others have done as well. So that could help out. Mm, absolutely. One um, tool I have, and Denny's kind of alluded to this, is um, online color wheels. They mm -hmm. say, I've found this one, coolers. Yeah. Link in the chat, <laughs> which is um, it's very multicolored, obviously, but you can uh, have fewer if you like. And then you can, yeah, you decide you like a color. Which one will I like? Pink. I mean, I'm not suggesting to use all of these colors. <laughs> but it's a nice way to find uh, the hex codes and things in yes. the first place. So I think, yeah. I would say when I, I love I love coolers. It's I I go to them a lot. Another one I use is um, my color dot space. 
um, mm. which is nice because it sort of gives you some different palettes as well. But again, I would say just like one thing with coolers is it gives you five colors. It doesn't mean you have to use all five. Just, you yeah. know, sometimes people go and they start trying to use all five colors that it's giving mm. you and then you have trouble with it. Even though they're colors that should work together, um, don't feel like you have to use all five of them. Find yeah. two maybe that are your primary or secondary and then just go with white and black from there. Yeah. And it'll make your life a lot easier. You can also use it for decorating your house if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, on the topic of colors, do you tend to use hex, RGB, or HSL, and why? So I tend to use hex just because it's easier to copy and paste it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's so especially because any most color pickers, when you get the the hex code, it's a simple copy and paste. Whereas when you're getting the RGB or the the HSL, you have to make a little modification to it to actually get it to work in your code. And I'm lazy. Um, so traditionally I've always used hex. I am trying to use HSL a lot more just because it's the easiest to understand. Like if you look at HSL, it's easy to understand compared like hex, you can have a general idea of what it is if you really want to bother with it, but it just looks yeah. like random numbers pretty much. Uh, so it's hard to predict or have an idea, or if you need to modify it, you go, I need this color to be a little lighter and you're looking at hex code, like it's, you're guessing almost. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go HSL, if you have a color and you want it a little lighter, a little darker or change, you know, push it one way or you need it a little bit more gray, you have your hue, your saturation, your lightness. So you play with the lightness value, it gets lighter or darker. You play with the saturation, it's either brighter or more towards grays. So from like a, an understanding point of view, it's definitely the easiest one. Um, so I'm trying to get in the habit of using it more just because it is, once you're actually using it, you got past that phase of putting it into your code, it's a lot easier to, to play with and to understand what's happening. Yeah, I can see that. I prefer hex as well, just because it's easier to type. Um, but hot tip, well, <laughs> I don't know how hot it actually is. Uh, we're doing HTML, color, picker, reshare. Um, so if Kevin was just talking about if you wanted a hex color that was uh, slightly lighter or darker, you can just go uh, type in HTML color picker, and then you've got the whole shade range of colors. So that's what I tend to do um, because I find anything that's not hex. Oh, I've just given away an entry. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw a question here that I was going to ask you anyway, but I'll ask it now because Chef is asking, I've recently got into Tailwind CSS. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and other frameworks as well? Yeah, so um, I think in, in general for frameworks, um, the issue I have with them is people will start using those instead of just diving into learning CSS because they're getting frustrated with CSS. So then they go to that tool instead. Mm. Um, and I think it's the same no matter what language you're learning. So with, with JavaScript uh, and then, you know, there's people that will learn React before. Lear and I, I did it back in the day. I learned jQuery before I learned JavaScript. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, oh, this is easier or this can do what I need to. Uh, but then if ever, you know, jQuery sort of died off and I was a little bit stuck at the time because that's mm -hmm. what I knew. And then I didn't really know the core JavaScript and I had to go back and take a step back mm -hmm. and learn JavaScript a lot better uh, at its core. And then, you know, no one ever, it, React is so big now, people don't think it's ever going to die, uh, but who knows? And then yeah. if it does and you don't know the core JavaScript, it's a little bit harder. Whereas if you know JavaScript, it's easier to move into a different one or pick one up from there. Same yeah. with CSS. Um, you know, if you learn Bootstrap and then, you know, you learned Bootstrap, you didn't really learn how CSS works. Uh, you learned how to use that. And if you need to make changes to it or make modifications to it, it's a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Tailwind's a little bit different just because it's sort of, you sort of need to understand CSS to be able to use it because it's just so utility, you know, you're almost writing CSS, but in class, you know, just adding all the classes that you need. Um, I think it's a wonderful tool. I, I understand why people like it so much. It's not, I don't like <laughs> writing my CSS that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so in a way, like it, it's not my thing and I, I, I'd enjoy writing CSS. So for me, it's not my, my mm -hmm. thing, but I really understand why people, why Tailwind is becoming so popular uh, and why it's taking off. Uh, but I would just say to make sure that you understand CSS really well before learning a framework. Um, I also think things like Tailwind, you know, it, if you use it properly and you're going through the whole workflow and then you're doing the purge CSS at the end, like you're file sizes can be minuscule, um, which is really, really wonderful and cool. 
And so even if you're not really getting into it, just seeing, and, and for me, I always like looking at frameworks and sort of learning from how a framework's working, why they're doing things a certain way, um, and then stealing ideas. Like I've, I've more recently started using a lot more utility classes in my own CSS than I ever used to. Mm. Um, and I, I'm starting to see more and more the benefit of it and how you do end up with smaller file sizes, things do get a bit more reusable. Um, but I sort of, you know, I have a, th a threshold and at one point I just, where I stop using utility classes and where I sort of custom style stuff more. But I think for everybody, it's a little bit different. Yeah. And I think along the lines of um, what you were saying about frameworks getting deprecated could also apply to uh, if you change your workplace or you get mm -hmm. a new job and they're using a different framework and you don't know it, then you've got to learn it. If you've got the CSS, my feeling is that would be a lot easier. Yeah, I think if you have a really good understanding of just the core language that learning a new framework should go really, really fast um, mm. and becomes a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Daniel's now asking, um, where do you think you'd be now if you weren't a YouTuber, streamer or course creator? What do you think <laughs> you'd be doing? Um, well, I, before I got into this, I was just teaching uh, at, uh, at a school, so I might still be still be teaching. Um, that was the last, the last job I had. So probably still doing that. Uh, mm. I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy educating. So it's definitely, I think it was never something I'd planned on getting into. Um, but then once I got into it, obviously I, I leaned into it pretty hard after that. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Can you give us three CSS tips people can use to quickly improve their styling? Uh, yeah, I guess it would lean back a little bit to from the very beginning, the, the first question, um, just talking about mistakes people make. So I think one thing that people mm. uh, just like leaning into um, inheritance in the cascade and taking advantage of it as much as they can, uh, I think simplifies life in the long run. Um, it's sort of where I have a little bit of an issue with some of the, the CSS, like you know, the J CSS and JS ideas where it's sort of trying to break away from that. Uh, again, it's sort of like with other things, I see why it exists. I get why people love it. And I think it can be a really good tool when it's used properly. Um, but it yeah. can also lead to lots of, you know, you're just writing so much code that you don't have to be, uh, sometimes like just taking advantage of the core functionalities of CSS and how it's meant to work with the inheritance cascade can really help you out. Um, and then also on that front, just make sure you always start with the big picture and then narrow down slowly look at what the global thing is what you know let's set up my typography first let's set up the the general background colors my colors my background images but like big picture stuff at the beginning not necessarily layout but just getting the content to sort of behave especially typography is always a big one for me it's you know you can do a lot just with some basic element selectors there you're taking advantage of your cascade it's all flowing through and then you get narrower and narrower um you know, you'll, you'll have an easier time in the long run if you do that, even though at the beginning, it feels like you're going slower, uh, because you're taking all this time to set things up instead of getting that one thing to look perfect. Mm. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Another, another tip I would give that's a bit more in a different direction and a really quick one is people really like taking focus states away, like the default focus state for that. Well, it used yeah. to be in Google, the blue, the blue glow that Google is much improved now, actually Chrome's Chrome's focus state is a lot nicer now. Um, but just not to remove that, um, people will do it as a default and I would just leave the default styling. And if you want to overwrite it with your own, go for it. Um, but just for, you know, taking, it, it's a really simple accessibility thing that you just leave it there. Um, and then again, if you need to overwrite it or you want to overwrite it with your own to do that, but you might forget an element or forget something along the way. So just leaving the default one on there, uh, I think is from an accessibility point of view is a really important thing. I like what you've done in um, the boot camp about just having it the same as the hover state as well, because that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. And it's all all there and ready to go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, front end says, hello, Kevin. I'm a big fan. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question is, what should people learn now that will be in demand in the future? I mean, sort of the nearish future, so could benefit them in maybe six months or so. Um. I do. Th um, it's a good question. I do think part of it is, again, going what we were just talking about of learning the core languages, learning like, you know, the base of both well, CSS and, and, and JavaScript specifically. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think just because it makes you much more versatile going forward, as you said, you change jobs, they're using, you know, maybe you were using React, now you're going to Vue, or you were going from uh, whatever, from Bootstrap to Tailwind. If you have the core skills, then it's much easier to make those adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that for me is always sort of, I, I think that's the type of advice that can always be there and <laughs> always be solid. Um, yeah. In terms of CSS and where it's going, um, there's a lot of exciting things coming up, but I guess just having, yeah, I don't think there's anything really cutting edge or new that's right on the doorstep, <laughs> sadly. Mm -hmm. um, other, you know, if you can figure out grid, I don't know when, I, I guess just grid and flexbox and having good understandings of those, but yeah, there's nothing really cutting edge that I can think of that would be a real, um, you know, aha, or this is what's going to be happening six months from now. The next big thing, yeah, yeah. all about those core skills. Jamie asks them, how soon should someone dive into writing SCSS over vanilla CSS? I'm a really big fan of SAS. Um, I think you can, if you have a, I don't like giving specific things because I think you you should have a decent understanding of CSS uh, and enough that you, you want to know where, like what's being output and what the best practices are. Like you don't want to just start doing something because it's working with SAS or with SCSS um, and then it, you're happy and it's working. You want to be able to look at what it's outputting and know that like, okay, this, this is the clean code that I would have written with CSS already. Mm -hmm. So like having enough of a base understanding um, is important. Uh, and one thing I really like with SAS is that it's one of those languages that you don't, because it's like an addition to CSS, you don't need to learn the entire thing. You can just, okay, I want to just add nesting. That's the only thing I'm going to use is nesting from it. And then you start using it, you add that to your arsenal, and then you go, okay, maybe I'm going to start learning mixins now. And you learn what mixins are, mm -hmm. you start learning how they work, you get more advanced with them, and then you go, oh, now let's try making my own functions and you start adding that in. So like, you don't have to just learn everything there is at once, which can be really nice. And I think it, it means mm. that as long as you have that base understanding and you're pretty comfortable with CSS, I think it's fine to start adding these small things like one step at a time. Makan asks, or well, a few people are asking actually, how important slash relevant is SAS? Um, the last I looked, it's pretty relevant. Um, there was the, actually this t-shirts from it, the, the state of CSS 2020. Uh, which was a survey that was done um, asking people about just like there's everything there is to know about CSS pretty much um, and what they're using, what they're happy with, where things are going and sort of to track the trends. Um, it's just a general survey about people's usage and SAS was pretty predominantly used out there. Mm. Um, I know that some people are moving away from it just because, you know, if you're doing React and you're using web components and stuff like that, like sometimes it's you're not using SAS necessarily, but I also know that there's mm -hmm. SAS functionality that's available to you in there. So, you know, it, it depends a little bit, I guess, on what you're doing, but um, it seems to be pretty prevalent uh, in the industry still today. So worth learning then. I by think so, yeah. yeah. Speaking of the industry, do you think you need good design skills to get a job? Or is it okay to just be good at CSS? I think it's perfectly fine to be just good at CSS. Uh, Having a good eye can really help just because you do need to be, if you're, if you, if a designer's handing you a design, you want to be able to, you know, see all the little details and all the things that the designer has mm. put the time into putting there. Um, but I don't think necessarily you need to be, a, you know, you don't need to be a, a great designer. Obviously it helps if you're working on your personal projects or you're doing things solo. So if you want to freelance, then the design side can definitely be a, mm. a very big benefit. Um, and if you're at a really small company, maybe you might be wearing multiple hats. So that does happen. Um, but, you know, a normal workflow, you'd be getting design files from somebody. So if you're get, just getting files handed off to you, just being good at, you know, being able to implement those ideas, I think is a, a, a good skill to have. Hmm. Yeah. So there's room in the industry for you if design is not your thing. By the yes, sound definitely. Of it. Yeah. Excellent. Diego says, why do companies ask for tons of skills and years of experience, even for an entry level position? Uh, that's frustrating. It's uh, just so you know, it's not only in this industry. <laughs> it's, uh, <Yeah. laughs> it's the same in, in multiple. I've, I've had a very strange path to get to where I am now, which has got me through you know, varying industries. Um, but and it's everywhere you look is the same thing where 
I think part of it is a, a disconnect between the recruiter and knowing what the job actually entails. <laughs> so some are the HR person who's putting the job posting together. I think sometimes there's disconnects there. Uh, they do it for gatekeeping to a certain extent, just to try and not get, you know, they might say three years experience when really, you know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply if you have less experience, mm -hmm. um, I think is an important thing to know. Um, and this is, I've never hired anyone, but I've talked to people who deal with that side of things or have dealt with that side of things, um, or people that are good at finding jobs and it's just, you know, apply to the job, even if you don't feel like you're qualified for it based on those qualifications that they're putting. I've seen crazy things that are asked where it's like a front end developer who also needs to know premiere and after effects. And like the, the list went on and on and on and you're going mm -hmm. like, nobody has this diversified skill set. um, yeah. but apply for the job and then you never know where it might go. Um, yeah, yeah, you've got nothing to lose. So, yes, a hundred percent. Yeah, especially if if it's a junior role or if it's like an entry level role. Um, you know, if they're saying that's what it is, uh, I think the other side is sometimes some companies want to hire. They're they're hiring. They're giving it that the job title because they want to pay for that job title, but they're hoping to get somebody who's more of a senior. <laughs> Yeah, um, but pay them based on a, a junior scale. So, you know, maybe that's a red flag as well, too. Yeah, very true. Good point. And um, software testing trends says any recommended free tool to do initial design work, like designing a layout? Uh, I'm a really big fan of Figma um, mm -hmm. and Adobe XD. So they're both free to use. Uh, they are there are paid options with them. So you but like as a base tool, you have access to everything. It's more on the collaboration side. Uh, that there's limitations, but if you're just doing your own things to work on your own, both of them, um, like with the Scrimba stuff, all the designs that I, I did it for my, for the career path stuff and for the, um, the responsive bootcamp, everything was done in XD. Um, yeah. and I go back and forth between XD and Figma and I don't, well, Adobe, I, I have a subscription, but Figma I haven't paid for. And it's a fan, really fantastic tool and very popular. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, um, well, both of them are good actually. Um, oh, I just saw I just saw one thing in, yeah. um, in the chat saying that it says it's free for up to three projects for Figma. There's also mm -hmm. a drafts mode, so you can actually have unlimited drafts, and every draft oh. can be its own project. So don't feel like oh, I can only have three saved files or something. Like my Figma has hundreds of files and hundreds of projects in it. They're just not officially projects; they're just drafts. So there's no limitation on that. Good news. <laughs> And um, David's asking, have you always done web dev? If not, where did you start? You sort of alluded to that just mm. now that you uh, did other things. So do you want to share what yeah, they were? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I, if you go way, way back, I studied after high school. Um, I was studying in the sciences. I switched to film. So I have um, mm. a college degree in film. I didn't do anything with that. I ended up with a BA in urban planning, which I didn't do anything with that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, then I went back to school and I got a, uh, a degree in design. So I was a graphic designer for a while and that's how I got back into, I, I did development as a hobby. Like I started making websites in the late nineties in high school, just for fun. Um, just, it seemed like a thing to do. And then I kept sort of randomly jumping back in and making random websites when I had in, you know, for fun and doing stuff with it. Um, and then when I was working as a designer, I, I would, primarily a print designer um, at a small agency or wasn't even really an agency, but a small company. And on, I wasn't paid a ton. I, I really enjoyed the job. I got a lot of really good experience, but the pay wasn't great. So I started freelancing on the side and mm. most of the freelance work I was getting was um, like UI design. So I'd be doing, you know, making what the website would look like. And that sort of said, I, you know, at the back of my mind, I was like, well, I know how to I've done development stuff before. So I decided, you know, if I can charge somebody to design a website, I could probably charge them more to design and build the website for them. Yeah. Uh, and so I started doing that uh, as well. And that's how I sort of dove back into the world of web development. And then I realized that I actually liked that side more than I did um, designing it. I enjoyed building the websites a lot more than I did uh, mm. designing. And then so that sort of became more of my focus uh, over time until I ended up getting hired as a teacher and then Funny, when I got hired as a teacher, it was at my old school, which still primarily focused on print design, but they did have a few web design classes. And that's pretty much for the first like two years I was there, that's almost all I taught. And I really wanted to teach them like the Photoshop stuff. And I just kept getting, you know, after, after two years straight of intro to web, web the HTML and CSS, I was like, I could really use something else now, but yeah. <laughs> and that's a, 
that's sort yeah. of why I started my YouTube channel as well. It was just to like keep going a little bit beyond the, the introduction to HTML and CSS. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Good story. <laughs> so I've got another question for you, and that is, uh, <laughs> what do you hate about CSS? <laughs> Um, I think now that I really, I, I'm, now that I'm really comfortable with it, I don't have a lot that bothers me. Um, there are a few, I think the biggest one that drives me nuts, like on a day to day basis is the lack of consistency when it comes to commas and hyphenation. Um, uh, so like for like some things, if you need multiple, you you space separate other time, like multiple values. I mean, so if you're doing like a property and then you need multiple values, you're putting spaces between them. Um, and then other times you do that, like with a box shadow, you're going to comma separate when you have multiple yeah. box shadows and it's like, well, why is it commas here? And then not, and then it really like, even now that I'm writing CSS every day, it's, I, you know, I remember sometimes and then other times, why is it not working? Oh, this doesn't take a comma or this does. Um, and there's a few of them that are the same with like, you know, if you do flex wrap, no wrap, it's the only one where it's two words that aren't hyphenated. And it's, you know, these, these little inconsistencies <laughs> that always come up that just drive you nuts because you put no wrap with a hyphen and then the dev tools are telling you that it's an invalid value and you're looking at it going, but, you know, I know that's the right one. And yeah, little things like that. The inconsistencies with like the syntax a little bit is probably what drives me the most nuts. Do you know what the cause of that is? I mean, I guess it's just different people developing it. Is that yeah. right? There's yeah, there's even, I, I think it might even, they have, I don't know if I could find it really fast. Um, I should have thought of it ahead of time. Uh, CSS mistakes we made. I'll see if I can get it. Re I don't can't see it right now. I know there's a page, I think in the actual CSS documentation somewhere, that's mistakes they made when they made the spec. Um, and <laughs> I think the no wrap one is actually in there. And there's, a, there's probably 10 or 15 things that they said, if they could have changed it, they would change it now type of thing. Um, and it's just, can't. yeah, we're stuck. Anything that's there now, we're stuck with. Fair enough. I've got, actually, I've just remembered last week, Michael, my husband, was here, and he showed me how to get questions on the screen. So I'm going to do that. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Moomin says, will Flutter 2.0 break the web development in future by eliminating HTML and CSS? I know nothing about Flutter. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not the right person to ask there either. I hope not, because I like <laughs> HTML and CSS. I, yeah. I, isn't it more cross, like, like Flutter's for, for like, cross app, well, like, iOS and Android development, right? Yeah, so I was going to wrong I, <laughs> So I, I don't think it's... I don't think HTML and CSS are going anywhere, especially because so much, like, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I think are here for the long haul just because unless whatever browser, whatever you're getting that can understand what Flutter is doing, uh, can also be backwards compatible with every website that was ever made with HTML, CSS and JavaScript, um, <laughs> that we're stuck with it. Right. Cause you need, like there's decades of, of history that's all there that needs to continue to be available. So I don't think they're going anywhere. And I think browsers are going to stick with, with the, what we have, but. I mean, who who really knows in the, in the the big picture what's going to happen? Yeah, and we'll still need HTML and CSS to make workarounds for IE for our <laughs> lifetime. So I wouldn't worry about it just yet. I think. I have another question from Wendy: Do you have experience of editing other CSS, and how did you deal with it? Yeah. Um, I have different types of experience. So as a teacher, I would be looking at people CSS a lot. Um, I've been brought into, I've had freelance work where I'm going in and taking a site that already exists. And I've also been brought mm -hmm. into teams and been working on a team that already has like an established code base. Yeah. Um, so each one is a little bit different. Um, if you're coming into an existing project, you need to spend the time at the beginning understanding what's happening before you start writing any code of your own. Um, yeah. So looking at just what's there, why did they do things in a certain way? You might see things you disagree with <laughs> or, you know, that might seem a little bit strange, but just understanding why they set things up the way they did, what the workflow was and, and how they decided on their naming convention and how they decided on everything they're doing. Um, and then you, you go from there, but just spending a few hours reading their code, I think is an important thing if you're coming into an, an existing project. 
Mm, yeah. Not Definitely. exciting stuff at all, but it is, you know, the first thing and I think it'll save you frustration in the long run. It is. Yeah. I can vouch for that actually. <laughs> and Danny says, each new technology says they'll take over, but it goes back to fundamentals in due time. Wise yeah. words indeed, Danny. Definitely. Um, so I've seen your video on uh, YouTube about uh, dealing with Internet Explorer. <laughs> and I've also seen um, in the responsive design uh, bootcamp, you mentioned how annoying it is that um, styling typography, everything is font, font size, font, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then there's just color on its own. Uh, so if you could change one of these things, so get rid of Internet Explorer or change color to font color, which would you go for? That's a hard, I, th I think, I think Internet Explorer might be dead finally, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's as close <laughs> as it's ever going to get right now anyway. <laughs> um, I, I, I'd probably take at this, uh, if it were, if Internet Explorer were to stay at the, the market share it has right now, I would probably go with the font color. I just think yeah. it's, that's one of those in inconsistencies that drives me batty. Um, and it would also prevent me from like the amount of times I've, when I set up a new project or when I'm trying to like debug something, I'll put a background color on stuff a lot of the time. The amount of times I've written color and oh, put yeah. a color and I'm going, why isn't my CSS working? Like what's wrong with it? Cause it, I, I meant to put background color. It's just one of those stupid mistakes I make at least twice a month and it drives me nuts. So if it was font color, I wouldn't make that mistake. <laughs> yeah. And then it could be in the shorthand as well. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think I would take that. I think it would now, if this was three years ago or five years ago, I'd probably have the opposite answer, but just their market share is small enough now that I think I, I'd make that sacrifice to, mm. to have a bit of ease on that thing and a bit more consistency. Yeah, that, that would be lovely. And um, another kind of uh, conundrum question, I suppose. If you had to choose between only using keyword colors or only using IDs and not classes, what would you go for? So I think the, you'd have to get a bit more creative to make your sites look good, but I would definitely go with the keyword colors only. Um, just because everything with an ID, I think would be a nightmare, <laughs> yeah. uh, going back to everything I was saying before with like, just taking advantage of the cascade and taking it, well, inheritance, I guess things would still inherit, but taking advantage mm -hmm. of, um, the cascade, but also just like having reusable classes and not, in, not having to have a different one for everything. Um, I think would, I think that would drive me nuts in the long run. I think that the, the, the color one seems like the first choice until you'd actually start writing it. And then within about five minutes, if you went with the IDs only, you'd, you'd be regretting it pretty fast. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Actually, there was a question uh, slightly earlier. Um, I can't remember what exactly it said, but it was along the lines of, um, so far they've only used keyword colors and is that bad? Um, I mean, they work if, if it's, if you're just learning and you, you're not too stressed about what the, like what's being output, as long as you just want to make sure there's a color there, I think it's fine. I use them a lot when I'm teaching just cause it's a lot faster for me when I'm needing to put a color on something. Mm. Um, so there's nothing wrong with it. I just think that at one point you do want to make that transition. Um, just because obviously if you're trying to implement an actual design, then you have to, uh, you know, use actual colors or well, mm. keywords are still colors, but. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, if you're learning, I don't think it's going to change anything. It's implemented the same way you're using the same practice. So I think it's fine. Yeah. Especially if you're just starting off. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Space time asks, do you think it's still possible to develop mainly with CSS and less JS? A hundred percent. Um, I think one of my issues with the web today, our front end development today is it's overcomplicated. Um, mm -hmm. but not, it, it's people taking over complicated solutions to simple problems. And so you get like these huge projects with tons of dependencies to put together something that could easily be a static site that doesn't need this complicated build that doesn't need any, like all this b weird backend stuff for some reason that might be going on with it. Um, that, you know, and then the page load is slow down and you're, you know, I think that just because maybe you're most comfortable with building some fancy single page application thing that, you know, that's what you know how to do really well. 
you know, sometimes if, if that's not what needed for the project you're working on, that taking a step back and, and realizing that. And I, I do think that that's why the whole Jamstack movement is growing so much, is that rise to trying to simplify things and go back toward, especially dealing um, to the, the, the client, you know, client side stuff and making that a lot lighter weight uh, and all of that and simplifying things on that level. But it mm. also depends on the project. Some projects, you know, you need to have a lot more going on. And if the project needs that, you need to have state and you need to have people logging in and you need, you know, if that's what the project yeah. requires, then you need it. But a lot of websites, you don't need anything too complex. Mm. Yeah, totally. Got uh, Carla asking, where can I learn advanced CSS? Um, I think, I, it depends what you mean by advanced CSS. <laughs> I think that everybody has a bit of a different idea uh, of what that might be. Um, there's lots, I mean, to a certain extent, we go into some some pretty good stuff, I think, within the, the responsive design bootcamp. Yeah. Um, you were getting into Flexbox and Grid and, and diving pretty deep into it. Um, there's also my YouTube channel where I go into, I guess the advantage on my YouTube channel is like, I'll just pick a random interesting topic. So it goes more into like niche things that don't, you wouldn't necessarily implement everywhere. Um, CSS tricks is an amazing resource for, I use that a lot just to sort of keep up with what's happening and where things are going. Um, there's more cutting edge stuff. Um, there's lots of really, there seems Smashing Magazine too has, has good content, but for CSS specifically, um, it depends if you want more of like, this is like a big picture thing, or if you just want sort of, this is like individual topics of more advanced things, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I've just uh, shared Kevin's course on Scrimba, his responsive design bootcamp, and his YouTube channel, in the course of which I managed to play his uh, channel, <laughs> oh, yeah. channel intro video. So that's why you had two Kevins talking <laughs> at once just now. Yeah, good tips. Um, where can I learn Figma and Adobe XD basics? Genesis says, yeah. Are there any courses or do you have any videos on those? I do have um, videos on both. Um, I don't, I haven't done anything on YouTube with XD for a while, so I don't actually remember what I put, <laughs> what my XD content is. Um, it was maybe six months ago, I did sort of two, probably three or four videos um, as an introduction to Figma. So there's sort of that. And honestly, the Figma documentation is really, they have their own YouTube channel too. Um, and they're sort of like, if you go onto Figma's website and you go through their helping files and stuff, um, they even give you like files that you can bring in two years and it has like the tutorial is the Figma file and you're, you know, making the changes to the file itself and they're giving you the okay. steps to do. Uh, their, their stuff is fantastic. Um, just going through their own site. Mm, excellent. That's like the, uh, the Scrimba methodology there when mm -hmm. you're learning, yeah. Yeah. interacting with it. <laughs> um, we've got, Siddharth, uh, what are your thoughts on CSS Houdini? I think it, I haven't done enough of a big deep dive into it to 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 teach it or anything like that. I do think it's cool, um, and it's something that I'm I'm learning more about and um, want to dive deeper into because I like what I've seen from it so far. What um, is it? I haven't heard of this, and maybe uh, some of the other viewers haven't either. Sounds like a framework or something. Is that right? Um, no, it's. I don't want to say the wrong thing, <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, I wish I had more experience with it. Um, it, it, it's from the browser, like the CSS engine itself. Um, let me just see if I can find a, a good thing. Cause, um, or here it's a, it's a set of low level APIs that expose parts of the CSS engine. There we go. <laughs> Is the official, the official part of it. So it sort of lets you like hook in. Um, to the browsers, like paint rendering and stuff. Um, it, it, it's it's pretty interesting, but it, it sort of dives into a, a different level uh, than sort of traditional CSS that you might think of, but it opens up some some interesting stuff along the way. Well, if you ever want to make a course on Scrimba about it, just give us a shout. <laughs> and I, I, I've only just like barely, I, I've looked at a few things with it and sort of, you know, you know, when you play with something, you're like, that's really cool. I want to learn more about it. And then that was as far as I got, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jimmy says, when starting a new project, how do you plan it and decide how to tackle it? This is interesting for me because I don't know why, but I find it easier to um, design as I code, whereas a lot of people seem to think you should do it on kind of paper or Figma or whatever first. 
Um, what's your preference on that? I tend, I think I get better results if I start with a design tool first, but mm -hmm. a lot of the time I won't bother and I'll start doing it in the browser. Really? Yeah. Um, the only reason that I like design tools is because it's a lot faster to iterate and to make changes. And then if you don't like it to go back, um, but you just, you know, you take your whole design and copy it and make changes and take that new version, copy it and make changes to it. Um, whereas, you know, if you make some, like, you know, you're playing with your font sizes or something, and then you have to command Z back 30 steps or something to what you had before. Um, yeah. which I definitely <laughs> do sometimes if anyone's watched my live streams that I do, you'll see that, you know, I, if I'm designing in the browser, there's a lot of going backwards and forwards and trying to see what's best. Um, but I do see like, if you're more comfortable with code and you haven't used something like Figma or XD that you're, you know, at the beginning, especially you'll be faster doing it in the code because it's the tool that, you know, hmm. uh, but it's, it's definitely something that I, I have done. Um, but yeah, if it's a brand new project, I try and convince myself to take the time to actually open up uh, a design tool and to, to get it there. I do think it's one step to, if it's a personal project and it's something you're working on, like actually coming up with the content before the design is also really important. Um, the design mm -hmm. side is always more fun, but the content can have a big influence on the design. So sometimes yeah. you design something, then you change the, you know, you put in something that was going to a nice section of your site that had one paragraph and all of a sudden you write this really long thing and it breaks everything that you had, or it looks terrible. Or you had a small card that had 15 words of text and then it turns out it's 45 and the card looks really strange all of a sudden, or the balance is off. So I do think the first thing is having all the content, um, even if it's not the finished, finished version, which I would recommend, like if I was doing it a client work, when I was freelancing, I like the first thing I would tell the client is I need all the content finished. Like there's no modifications. Give me the finished content that will be going on the page. And then we can start taking the steps of designing it and doing the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, so having the content and planning what the site's for, what the purposes are, knowing all the pages that you're going to need, then you get into the design and then you get into implementing the design from there. And depending on how complicated the implementation of the design is, I do think that's also where it can be nice to have, if it's a small single page personal project, then it's not as important. But if you're doing like this big multi-page thing, actually having the design there so you can look at it all on your screen all at once. And that's where you get that big picture overview of what you're going to be building can really help as well. Yeah, no, good tips. Okay, I think it's time to have a look awesome. at these 404 pages. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, reshare my screen. Sorry, Wendy, I've just re-added your question. That wasn't intentional. It was a lovely question, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do it. That's the quiz. So the first one I've got here is um, Bishnu, which we thought was cool at Scrimber Towers. I should mention, actually, how did we judge this? We had a little vote um, among the Scrimber team. And the ones with the most votes are here. So yeah, that's how we did it. Um, yeah, well, what's cool about um, Bishnu's design is that, oh, if you come to the 404, you can then search mm -hmm. um, as you can on the Scrimba homepage and find a site. So you get directed straight back in. Yeah, I think that's a nice step. I think it definitely, you did a nice job of making it look like it's part of Scrimba's, Scrimba's page. And I, I like that idea of not just having to hit a back button that you can keep going from where you are. Uh, it's a nice, a nice touch. Yeah, it's cool. And you might find a course that you didn't already know about. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Cool. Then I've got uh, <laughs> this, this made me laugh. This is from our tour. So this is the uh, core Scrimba <laughs> team. And we've all got our little open peaks. And then uh, you can, I'm not sure if this means who should fix it or who <laughs> you should blame. <laughs> but either way, we'll go for me. And then the facial expressions change. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, internally screaming. And then if you keep doing this and you get all the same person, it changes color. And it takes different amounts of times to do it. Uh, I'm not really sure how the game works, but I think it's quite cool. And it's nice to see myself in an open peep. Yeah, that's so fun. It's, yeah, very cool. It's always fun when 404 pages have like an interactive fun element to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the Figma one has, uh, I think the Figma logo or something you can play with. Like, mm. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. 
And the next one here, I uh, can't remember his form. Oh, Gagan Deep. I think this is quite cool. I shall refresh it to show you its nice. full beauty. Yeah. And then you've got a little let's go home button. But what I noticed about this one is that on this Open Pete's laptop, he's got the Scrimba logo. That's a nice touch. It is very sweet. Yes. And then we've got this one from Palak. 404. It looks like the page doesn't exist. Head back home with a nice little animation. Awesome. And uh, then this one here, I thought was super cool. Uh, this is from Bahmood. It's got a nice little animation and in an homage to our original 404 page, mm -hmm. it's kept this little, um, I don't know what you call them. It's not an emoji, but the, the shrug. Uh... Man, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> punctuation dude. And uh, then you can check out our popular courses. And they've That's... even put in the effect that happens when you um, hover over them. So that is, a, I mean, part of the challenge was keeping it uh, in keeping mm -hmm. with the rest of Scrimba. And you can't argue with that on this yeah, one. I think that's awesome. Now, this one <laughs> is super cool. It's David. And you look at it and you think, oh, what's going on? Nice and plain. But then you realize you've got a <laughs> built-in snake game, which I'm now going to show off how little hand-eye coordination <laughs> oh, I actually got the first one and sometimes not that I've spent too long playing this uh, <laughs> different colored apples but what's really cool about it is it says you can navigate to Scrimba to learn how to code fun games like this and we do actually have a snake game that's a nice touch it is although um not great for productivity no yeah <laughs> but, uh, never mind <laughs> yes now this one is from Genesis. Um, oops, the page you're looking for no longer exists. Unless you're looking for a Kevin Powell Easter egg. Any ideas where the Easter egg might be? You can answer in the chat as well. I'll give people a chance to, to answer. Yeah, I'm going to say, I really enjoy this uh, disconnected yeah. club as well. I love these. They're so People are so creative with the, what they did. It's awesome to see all the different things. They are really cool it's difficult to know what to do okay i'll i will spoil it oh <laughs> <laughs> it really is a kevin powell easter egg <laughs> it really is yeah awesome someone said the plug maybe i thought that but it wasn't no, yeah it that would that would have been my guess too yeah. it was a hidden one <laughs> right in there yeah um and then the last one is this from Costub. So it's a scrim, um, which we don't already have in the 404 page, which is a bit of an oversight, really. Um, and you can see how the 404 page is built, and then get ready. Oh. <laughs> That's nice. it. He has Rickrolled us. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> So those are the designs. That's cool to, to implement the scrim into the page too. That's awesome. It is, yeah. Um, I am going to put the um, poll in the chat and we're going to have a very short amount of time to vote, partly because we're running low on time um, and partly because I'm dying to know who's going to win. So I'm going to use my obnoxious timer, which is now famous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not for much longer. Not that I want to spoil things. Uh, what should I do? Uh, I'll give you two minutes. Yeah. So get your votes in now, and then we will find out who has won the 404 competition. Now we're thinking about how we're actually going to do this. And what we can say is um, pending, <laughs> The winning design matching up with Scrimba's technology. Um, that one will definitely go in. If someone's used some obscure framework or something that Scrimba can't use, then you might have to redesign it. Um, or hopefully not. And we're also hoping to make some space for two runners up. So you can do something, which I'm about to talk about something I don't fully understand, which I, happens to me a lot actually. It's called load balancing. 
And basically what it means is uh, if you have, say, three sites, you can load each one 33% of the time, yeah, yep. for example. So, yeah, we're going to have a look in that and see whether we can do it. Cool. My name is not on the list in the poll. Oh, no, I've screwed it up. Well, that's a bit annoying. Sorry, Palak. <laughs> uh, how can I get around that? If you want to vote for Palak, you can mention it in the chat. And I'll have to count manually. And then, ah, oh. OK, stop. Serby says, I saw my design in the form, but I think you forgot to show it. I did. So I'm going to try and find it now. Um, have you got the link to it, Serby? This is what happens if you try and change things either <laughs> later on. I think I can find it. The joy of the being in. live. I know the. I, I, I know your pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. No, it's in my. Uh, what's it? My four oh four responses. Here you go. Yes, so this one um, I thought was nice because it's quite topical. We got the mm. person with the mask on and it says, you're getting a bit too close. <laughs> How sweet is that? Very nice. I like the ones on the bike. Now, because I've monumentally screwed it up, I'm going to give you another, um, if I can, 60 seconds to vote. And then we're going to see who the winner is. And in the meantime, I'll let you know um, what the next challenge is. So I was saying how my uh, timer is obnoxious and it's an ongoing issue. <laughs> so the next challenge is to make a better timer. And I've made this one, which arguably isn't much better. <laughs> but I'm sure that... Um, the challengers will make a new one. Leanne, did I choose? Did you choose the designs to show Kevin among all the designs sent? Um, not just me. We voted for them at Scrimba Towers, but we did look at all of them. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't start the timer. Okay. Well, I think it's fair to say that the vote has closed. So let's find out who has won. Do, 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 do. Uh, where are the results? Okay. I'm keeping the suspense up. Ooh, interesting. I can't actually see who that is. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> it's Artur. So that's uh, this one. Oh, nice. Yeah, very nice. And that awesome. deserves a round of Congratulations, yeah. So people can see my internally screaming. <laughs> yeah. And that's just brilliant. Woo, well done. Oh, Hope of Glory wants to know which one Kevin would have chosen. Do you feel comfortable disclosing? Um, I don't know, there's a few, there's a lot of them are really good. <laughs> it's, this, I like this one just, I like anything that's interactive. So something like this where the person can play on the page, I thought was really nice. Um, I like the one where you could, um, the, like with the actual scrim in the page so you could actually i guess you could actually even change the code yourself on it which is fun and it yeah. Had, yeah and we got rick rolled so that's always good yeah uh, um, <laughs> <Surely>. <laughs> <laughs> um i forget what some of the other ones were but i don't know it i it's mean this nice. is fun too i think yeah. anything i mean just the interactivity is always is good and it's always fun being able to waste time when you end up on the wrong page of something to, <laughs> absolutely yeah um but honestly like just the creativity of everything and all of them was really really good and really fun i like you know and and the implementation I, I do think a big part of the challenge was making sure it fit with the look and feel of scrimba's existing page and i think they all did an, um, like a really really nice job of being able to do that um so like i think hats off to everybody who, who got those in it's really really awesome yeah a few queries in the chat um why wasn't mine there they were all very good um, but we had to limit the amount in the poll. So these are the ones that received the most votes from Scrimba Towers. But thank you very much for submitting them. We enjoyed them. And you can still use them for your portfolio, don't forget. So, yeah, that was 
Very good. Software testing trend says, I love the scrim one. Right? It's hard not to love something that directs you onto a Rick roll. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Um, if you haven't joined the weekly web dev challenge yet, you can do so here. Oh. <laughs> I recently changed the color to white and it looks a bit odd. So I might change that back. But anyway, here's the, um, the link. And uh, the next stream, we will be joined by Danny Thompson. He's a software developer who got a job um, with no CS degree, and he wants to share his learning strategy and encourage you to not give up. So hit that bell. I'm going to put the link in here. And now uh, Def we've got Definitely go, Danny's awesome. You'll have, a, you'll have a great time with him. Yeah, he is a lot of fun. Um, we've got Breakout happening now with Alex from Scrimba and Bob Zerol. So you can go. And they will spit you into uh, Zoom rooms to discuss thought-provoking questions, some about Scrimba, some about CSS, maybe, probably not, more like React. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's quite a fun thing to do. So head over there now if you want to chat to Alex and Bob. So yeah, um, thanks very much for joining us, Kevin. That was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. It was, yeah. And I'll see everyone next week. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.